Hello and welcome to Let's Play Temple of Terror by Ian Livingstone. Uh, this is book number 14 in the Fighting Fantasy series. Um, and here's the cover art. There we go. Okay, let's read the synopsis. Fighting Fantasy Books, over 12 million copies sold worldwide. Uh, the dark, twisted power of the young Malbordus is reaching its zenith. I think that's how you pronounce that word. Um, all Malbordus needs now is to retrieve the five dragon artifacts which have been hidden for centuries in the lost city of Vatos. Each day that passes brings him closer to them, and only you can stop him. Your mission is to reach Vatos first and destroy the treasures Malbordus seeks. But beware, each step you take leads you closer to your doom. Two dice, a pencil and an eraser are all you need for this adventure. You decide which route to follow, which dangers to risk, and which monsters to fight. Uh, cover illustration by Christos Achillion, I think that's what it says. And there's Ian Livingstone, there we go. Uh, for some reason I had to rotate the PDF because, um, well, I'll show you. Uh, yep, rotate right. Yeah, because for some reason it's like that, I don't know why. So I've shown you the cover art and that's it. Anyway, so yeah, my PDF of this is like that for some reason. Okay, let's read the more in-depth synopsis here. Puffin Books, Temple of Terror. Uh, the dark, twisted power of the young Malbordus is reaching its zenith. The elves who raised him have set him one final task to retrieve the five dragon artifacts hidden for centuries in the lost city of Vatos somewhere in the desert of skulls. Only when he has these in his grasp will he be able to rise up and engulf Alansia. Each day that passes brings him closer to them and only you can stop him. Your mission is to cross the searing desert sands, find the mysterious lost city and destroy the treasures Malbordus seeks before he can reach them. But beware, each step you take leads you closer to your doom. Ian Livingstone co-founder of the highly successful Games Workshop and multimillionaire and editor of White Dwarf has created a thrilling adventure of sword and sorcery complete with an, with an elaborate combat system and an adventure sheet um, on which to record your gains and losses. All you need are two dice, a pencil and an eraser. Many dangers lie ahead, and your success is by no means certain. It's up to you to decide which route to follow, which dangers to risk, and which adversaries to fight. Ian Livingstone's Temple of Terror, illustrated by Bill Houston. Puffin Books, there we go. Okay, this is quite a, a late edition, because it shows uh, lots of other books in the series. Anyway, so we've done Freeway Fighter, and we're now on to Temple of Terror, then it's on to the Rings of Kether, then Seas of Blood. Uh, I think that's uh, uh, a nautical one, if I, if I remember. Um, can't remember how I might know that. Hmm. <coughs> Appointment with Fear, I think that's a sort of spy one. Anyway, enough of that. Uh, Rebel Planet, that's another futuristic one. Um, yeah, so we're getting through them. Anyway, there's, uh, there's the, uh, the inside cover art or whatever, sort of angry looking man or whatever, with, with a lantern that looks like a telephone box. Anyway, uh, to Chris Aki Achilleos and Ian McCaig for making fantasy a reality. Enough of the fantasy, let's talk reality. Okay, first published 1985, copyright Ian Livingstone, 1985, illustrations, copyright Bill Houston, 1985, blah, 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 blah. Okay, um, here we go, right. Okay, it's the Speed Talking Competition. Fighting monsters, before embarking on your adventure, you must first determine your own strengths and weaknesses. You have in your possession a sword and a shield together with a rucksack containing provisions, food and drink for the trip. Okay. So we've got a sword and a shield, so put that in the equipment. Um, 
you must use dice to determine your initial skill and stamina scores. On pages 20 to 21, there is an adventure sheet which you may use to record the details of an adventure. Uh, on it, you will find boxes for recording your skill and stamina scores. You are advised either to record your scores on the adventure sheet in pencil or make photocopies of the page to use in future adventures, or use a notebook, seriously, scrap paper. Skill, stamina, and luck. Roll one die, add six to this number, and enter, the to and enter this total in the skill box on the adventure sheet. Here we go. Right, roll one die. No. No. Yes. All right. So we get. <coughs> excuse me. So we get a five. Uh, add that to six. That's eleven. So we. <coughs> so we get eleven skill. Uh, excuse me uh, for just a moment. And I'm back. Sorry, I just had to. Had to cough something there. Um, anyway. Yep. So our skill is eleven. All right. Let's keep going. Roll both dice. Add twelve to the number rolled and enter this total in the stamina box. Oh, roll both dice. No. 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 Nope. 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 Yep. That'll do. Right. Okay. So, let's add 12 to that. That gives us 24. Oh, no. I cheated. Sue me. Right. Oh, no. I've ruined it. Oh, no. Well, no, everything is going to... The world's going to end now. Anyway, there is also a luck box. Roll one die, add six to this number, and enter this total in the luck box. All right, here we go. Roll one die. No! No. Yes. All right, so that's 11 luck. That's pretty good. I was very lucky there, wasn't I? All right, um... No, that's that. Uh, for reasons that will be explained below, skill, stamina, and luck scores change constantly during an adventure. You must keep an accurate record of these scores, and for this reason you are advised either to write small in the boxes or to keep an eraser handy, but never rub out your initial scores. Although you may be awarded additional skill, stamina, and luck points, these totals may never exceed your initial scores, except on very rare occasions when you when you will be instructed on a particular page. Your skill score reflects your swordsmanship and general fighting expertise. The higher the better. Your stamina score reflects your general constitution, your will to survive, your determination and overall fitness. The higher your stamina score, the longer you will be able to survive. Your luck score indicates how naturally lucky a person you are. Luck and magic are facts of life in the fantasy kingdom you are about to explore. What if it's a principality? Or a duchy. Hmm. Battles. Uh, you will often, <coughs> excuse me, you will often come across pages in the book which instruct you to fight a creature of some sort. An option to flee may be given, but if not, or if you choose to attack the creature anyway, you must resolve the battle as described below. First, record the creature's skill and stamina scores in the first vacant monster encounter box on your adventure sheet. The scores for each creature are given in the book each time you have an encounter. The sequence of combat is thus. Roll the two dice once for the creature. Add its skill score. This total is the creature's attack strength. Roll the two dice once for yourself. Add the number rolled to your current skill score. This total is your attack strength. If your attack strength is higher than that of the creature, you have wounded it. Proceed to step 4. If the creature's attack strength is higher than yours, it has wounded you. Proceed to step 5. If both attack strength totals are the same, you have avoided each other's blows. Start the next attack round from step 1 above. 4. You have wounded the creature, so subtract 2 points from its stamina score. You may use your luck here to do additional damage. See over. Five, the creature has wounded you, so subtract two points from your own stamina score. <clears throat> Again, you may use luck at this stage. See over. Six, make the appropriate adjustments to appropriate adjustments to either the creature's or your own stamina scores, and your luck score if you use luck. See over. Begin the next attack round. Repeat steps one to six. This sequence continues until the stamina score of either you or the creature you are fighting has been reduced to zero. Death. Fighting more than one creature. If you come across more than one creature in a particular encounter, the instructions on that page will tell you how to handle the battle. Sometimes you will treat them as a single monster, sometimes you will fight each one in turn. 
At various times, yeah, that's that. At various times during your adventure, either in battles or when you come across situations in which you could either be lucky or unlucky, details of these are given on the pages themselves. You may call on your luck to make the outcome more favourable, but beware: using luck is a risky business, and if you're unlucky, the results could be disastrous. The procedure for using your luck is as follows: roll two dice. If the number rolled is equal to or less than your current luck score, you have been lucky, and the result will go in your favour. If the number rolled is higher than your current luck score, you have been unlucky, and you will be penalised. This procedure is known as testing your luck. Each time you test your luck you must subtract one point from your current luck score thus you will soon realize that the more you rely on your luck the more risky this will become using luck in battles on certain pages of the book you will be told to test your luck and will be told the consequences of your being lucky or unlucky however in battles you always have the option of using your luck either to inflict a more serious wound on a creature you have just wounded or to minimize the effects of a wound the creature has just inflicted on you if you have just wounded the creature, you may test your luck as described above. If you are lucky, you have inflicted a severe wound and may subtract an extra two points from the creature's stamina score. However, if you are unlucky, the wound was a mere graze and you must restore one point to the creature's stamina, i.e. instead of scoring the normal two points of damage, you have now scored only one. If the creature has just wounded you, you may test your luck to try to minimize the wound. If you are lucky, you have managed to avoid the full damage of the blow. Restore one point of stamina, i.e. instead of doing two points of damage, it has done only one. If you're unlucky, you have taken a more serious blow. Subtract one extra stamina point. Yes, yeah, so even if you're unlucky, it's sort of better for you than it is for the creature. Remember that you must subtract one point from your own luck score each time you test your luck. Restoring skill, stamina and luck. Skill. Your skill score will not change much during your adventure. Occasionally a page may give instructions to increase or decrease your skill score. A magic weapon may increase your skill, but remember that only one weapon can be used at a time. You cannot claim two skill bonuses for carrying two magic swords. Your skill score can never exceed its initial value unless specifically instructed. Stamina and Provisions Your stamina score will change a lot during your adventure as you fight monsters and undertake arduous tasks. <clears throat> as you near your goal, your stamina level may be dangerously low and battles may be particularly risky so be careful your backpack contains enough provisions for 10 meals let's do that 10 it's always 10 though isn't it uh, you may rest and eat at any time except when fighting but you may eat only one meal at a time oh that's uh, I sometimes eat two meals at a time so is that a new addition I can't remember maybe I've been cheating all this time oh no um, eating a meal restores four stamina points. When you eat a meal, add four points to your stamina score and deduct one point from your provisions. A separate provisions remaining box is provided on the adventure sheet for recording details of provisions. Remember that you have a long way to go, so use your provisions wisely. Remember also that your stamina score may never exceed its initial value unless specifically instructed on a page. <coughs> Luck. Uh, additions to your luck score are, are awarded through the adventure when you have been particularly lucky. Details are given on the pages of the book. Remember that, as with skill and stamina, your luck score may never exceed its initial value. Uh, equipment. You will start your adventure with a bare minimum of equipment, but you may find other items during your travels. You are armed with a sword and are dressed in leather armour. Right, now it says I have armour. Okay, leather armour. Um, you have a rucksack, haversack, backpack, whatever, on your back to hold your... Really? I have a backpack on my back? I thought I was going to wear it on my head. To hold your provisions and any treasures you may come across. You also carry a lantern which lights your way. Okie dokie, lantern as well. Um, yep, there's a desert. Oh, excuse me, yawn there. Uh, hints on play. Your journey will be perilous and you are likely to fail on your first attempt. Make notes and draw a map as you explore. This map will be invaluable in future adventures and enable you to progress rapidly through to unexplored sections. Not all areas contain treasure. Many merely contain traps and creatures which you will know of which you will no doubt fall foul. You may make wrong turnings during your quest, and while you may indeed progress through to your ultimate destination, it is by no means certain that you will find uh, for what you are searching. It will be realised that entries make no sense if read in numerical order. It is essential that you read only the entries you are instructed to read. Reading other entries will only cause confusion and may lessen the, the excitement during play. 
The one true way involves a minimum of risk, and any player, no matter how weak on initial dice rolls, should be able to get through fairly easily. Eh, wrong. May the luck of the go of God go with you on the adventure ahead. Oh, oh, this is new. The adventure sheet on this p uh, the book from which this uh, PDF was copied. Uh, the, the adventure sheet of which has uh, not been used. This is a uh, this is a, uh, this is a momentous occasion. Hmm. Uh, a very rare occasion indeed. Okay, um, background. Perhaps it was because he was born during a full moon, with wolves howling around his mother's forest hut, that Malbordus's nature was evil. Perhaps it was something more sinister than that, but it is certainly that, after his mother abandoned him, Malbordus grew up in Darkwood Forest in the care of dark side elves. He was taught the elves' wicked ways, and also discovered powers of his own. He could make plants wither and die simply by snapping his fingers. He could make animals obey him with his piercing gaze. The elves urged him on and helped him develop his powers so that they could teach him the arcane and evil magic of the ancient elf lords, magic so vile and powerful that it kills unworthy users. In pursuit of such evil powers, Malbordus grew into manhood. In order to prove to the elves that he was ready to receive the elf lord's knowledge, he first had to pass a test. He was ordered to journey south to the desert of skulls to find the lost city of Vatos. In the city were hidden five dragon artifacts which he would have to find and collect. A simple incantation would bring the dragons to life to serve the forces of evil. Malbordus would then instruct them to fly him back to Darkwood Forest, where a massive army would be assembling. He would receive the ancient powers and lead the hordes of chaos across Alansia in an unstoppable wave of death and destruction. It was only by a stroke of luck that these terrible plans were discovered. On the edge of Darkwood Forest lived a strange old wizard named Yazdromo. Something of an eccentric, he lived alone in his tower, practicing simple magic and communicating with animals and birds. He was always willing to sell small magic items that he could afford to have brought to him delicious cakes from all over Alansia. His sweet tooth was the cause of his only link with the outside world, as he rarely left his tower. It was therefore much to everyone's surprise that he came huffing and puffing into the village of Stonebridge. What could possibly have forced old Yazdromo to venture through Darkwood Forest to Stonebridge? All the dwarfs who lived there were eager to find out, and a message was sent to Gillibrand, their king. Or Gillibrand, I'll say Gillibrand. After the rigours of a recent quest, you are resting in Stonebridge, enjoying the merry company of the dwarfs. Your wounds are almost healed, and the local blacksmith has honed the blade of your sword as only dwarfs can. Resting on a porch with your feet up on the railing, you are intrigued by the commotion. In front of you, in the village square... Uh, you are intrigued by the commotion in front of you in the village square. Um... Followed by a throng of inquisitive dwarfs, he has Stromo climbs the stone steps <coughs> of Gillibrand's house and is warmly greeted, greeted at the top by the king. The crowd falls silent when Gillibrand raises his hand, and Yastromo turns to speak. You slide out of your chair and join the crowd to hear what the wizard has to say. With a glum expression, his face almost as long as his beard, Yastromo relates the bad news concerning Malbordus. The dwarfs look up apprehensively, as though expecting the five dragons to, de to descend upon them at any moment. He calls on them to show courage, saying, Friends, look on the bright side. At least we are warned of our impending doom. Thanks to my pet crow, who overheard the conversation between the Dark Elves and Malbordus. What we must do now is to find someone who can reach the lost city before Malbordus and destroy the dragon artifacts. Yeah, I prefer saying someone instead of somebody. I always think somebody sounds a bit sort of... Um, I can't think of the word, sort of harsh in some uh, somehow. Anyway, um, uh, before Malbordus and destroy the dragon artifacts. We need a fear, fearless young warrior who is willing to risk life and limb to save us all. Is there one among you who would, who would volunteer? Each dwarf looks around to see if another has dared to accept the challenge. Standing there watching the worried dwarfs, you realise that there is only one thing you can do. With a wry smile on your face, you raise your arm in the air and offer your services. Yastromo sees you and says, Haven't I seen you somewhere before? 
Never mind, you look like the kind of person we want. Make way for our brave volunteer. We must leave for my tower immediately. Come along, let's be off. Why do they only want one? Why don't they want a group of them? Because surely a group would be more more likely to be successful than one. Anyway, we must leave for my tower immediately. Come along, let's be off. You have a lot to learn, but I cannot teach you much until we are safely through Darkwood Forest and inside my laboratory. You hardly have time to cram your belongings into your backpack before the impatient wizard leads you out of Stonebridge towards his tower on the southern edge of Darkwood Forest. Now turn over. Here we go. For an old man, Yastromo is surprisingly sprightly. You cross Red River and the ploughed fields beyond and soon reach the edge of the forest. Yastromo still doesn't stop. He takes a narrow path leading into the dark wall of trees. The light fades. Branches and knotted roots obstruct the twisting path and make the walk very tiring. You ask Yastromo why he seems unconcerned at the possibility of being attacked by forest monsters. He chuckles and tells you that his magic is well known and respected by all the creatures for miles around. None would dare to challenge Yastromo. After spending a peaceful night in the forest, you reach Yastromo's tower by mid-morning the next day. Uh, you follow him up the spiral staircase to a large room at the top of the tower. Shelves, cupboards and cabinets line the walls and are filled with bottles, jars, books, boxes and all manner of strange artefacts. Yastromo yes, slumps down in into his old oak chair, by now looking quite tired from the long journey. He reaches into his pocket and pulls out a fragile pair of gold-rimmed spectacles. After placing them on his nose, he peers at you over the top of them, and you feel quite unnerved by his piercing gaze. Finally, he says, anyone who would hope to defeat Malbordus must certainly know a little magic. You look bright enough to learn some, but I don't think you have time to absorb, absorb the ten spells I would like to teach you. By the way, I would like you to know how privileged you are to learn my magic, but a crisis is a crisis, now let's get on with it. Okay, before I turn over, there's Yastromo. Which spells shall I teach you? You have the choice of Open Door, Creature Sleep, Magic Arrow, Language, Read Symbols, Light Fire, Jump, Detect Trap, and Create Water. So make your choice, turn to 34. Let's do that. Choose any of the following spells. You will be sent back to this reference after having learned a spell. As soon as you have learned, oh, as soon as you have learned four spells, turn to 180. You think about the task ahead before telling Astroma your choice. Okay, we are going to choose Sleep Creature. So let's go to uh, Creature Sleep. Sorry, uh, 58. <clears throat> yeah, Stromo explains that his creature sleep spell will put to sleep any humanoid creature. He tells you the incantation necessary to cast a spell and says that it hardly drains your energy at all, merely by one stamina point each time you use it. Return to 34 after writing down the spell and its stamina cost on your adventure sheet. Okay, we have creature sleep, so let's write that down. Creature sleep, I'll just put... Uh, minus one, because it takes away one stamina, obviously. Okay, now we're returning to 34, and my foot is extremely itchy. Alright, uh, yeah, 34. Oh, that's better. I hate it when your foot's itchy, and then you can't scratch it because your sock or your shoe is in the way, and it, it's never good enough scratching it over the top of your sock. It's never good enough. Anyway, um... Okay, so now we're going to choose light. So we're going to turn to 223. Yeah, Stromo explains that his light spell will illuminate any room, cavern or area, whether its darkness is natural or magical. He tells you the incantation necessary to cast the spell and says that the energy drained when casting it is not too much, only two stamina points are lost each time you use it. Return to 34 after writing down the spell and its stamina cost in your adventure sheet. Okay, so light. 
That's, that is minus two, isn't it? Yep. Okay, uh, 34 we go. Oh, here we go. We're then going to choose fire, so turn to 264. Yes, yeah, Stromo explains that his fire spell can be used either to make a defensive wall around the caster or simply to ignite a torch or lantern with your fingertips. He tells you the incantation necessary to cast a spell and says that the energy loss when casting a spell will vary according to the intensity of fire required, but will use either one or two stamina points each time. After noting down the spell and its stamina cost on your adventure sheet, return to 34. Okay, so fire, uh, minus one, or minus two. There we go. And um, we're going back to 34. And finally, we're going to choose open door. Uh, so turn to 12. Yes, yeah, Stromo explains that his open door spell will open any locked door. He tells you the incantation necessary to cast a spell and says that it will not drain your energy too much. Only two stamina points will be lost each time you use it. Return to 34 after writing down the spell and its stamina cost on your adventure sheet. Okay, so that's uh, open door. And it costs two. There we go. And we're going to 34. As soon as you have learned four spells, turn to 180. Uh, the old wizard looks at you solemnly and says, Every minute is vital. You must begin your journey immediately. Without doubt, Malbordas will learn of your mission to thwart him and may send an assassin or two after you. My crow will lead you as far as Catfish River. From there you can either take a river vessel to Port Black Sand and then a sailing ship south or journey overland to the Desert of Skulls. A grim task is ahead of you, but our thoughts will be with you. Yes, Stromo leads you back down the spiral staircase and out into the open. Suddenly, he gives a, sh a shrill whistle. A no, oh, uh, Suddenly, he gives a, a shrill whistle. A large crow immediately swoops down from the top of the tower and settles on his shoulder. Now, crow, guide our friend as far as Catfish River and make sure you keep a good lookout. The last thing we want is an ambush on our own doorstep. You shake hands with Yazdromo and reassure him that you will destroy the dragons of Vatos before Malbordas can attain his evil goal. He smiles and hands you a pouch containing 25 gold pieces. That's that. Right. He then commands his crow to fly south. The crow squawks and flies off. You hurry after it, turning just once to wave goodbye to old Yazdromo. Um, walking through the tall grasses, a shiver runs down your spine at the thought of Malbordas' assassins coming after you. You travel steadily south, only deviating twice to circumvent danger spotted by the crow. Three hours later, you, you arrive at the banks of Catfish River at a point where it is spanned by a rope bridge. An old barge is moored to a jetty beneath the bridge. There it is. And you see several rough-looking characters unloading sacks. There they are. If you if you wish to if you wish to cross the bridge, turn to 23. If you wish to buy your passage on the barge to Port Black Sand, turn to 213. Okay, we are going to buy passage on the barge to Port Black Sand and turn to 213. After watching the crow fly back towards Yastromo's tower, you follow the path to the jetty and walk confident, confidently up to the first crewman um, to whom you come. You ask to talk to the captain. He, he eyes you suspiciously and after a long pause says, Follow me. He leads you on to the barge and knocks his hesitantly on one of the cabin doors. A gruff voice shouts, Enter! The crewman opens the door and gestures, gestures at you to enter the cabin. You stride into the cabin and see a stocky man dressed in clothes that have seen better times. He asks you your business and you tell him that you wish to buy your passage to Port Black Sand. 
Anyone who would pay to get to the city of thieves must be either desperate or insane, he says laughing. It will cost you five gold pieces. If you wish to pay the captain his asking price, turn to 67. If you wish to haggle, turn to 146. We're going to haggle and turn to 146. You tell the captain that you will offer him no more than two gold pieces. He scorns your offer, but after a few minutes of haggling, you agree on a fee of three gold pieces. You shake hands with the captain, pay him, and walk out of the cabin. Turn to 102. So now we have 22 gold pieces left. Uh, 102, then. Always worth haggling. Why not? The barge is neither very large nor designed for paying passengers, but you find a coil of thick rope on which to lie. After your long walk, you are soon sound asleep, and do not wake until one of the crew taps you on the shoulder to say that Port Black Sand is in sight. You stand up and watch the sinister-looking city grow larger as you approach. Ten minutes later, you pass under a great arch to enter the city walls. The crew soon have the barge moored, obeying the frantic orders of the captain, who is obviously eager to load up his waiting cargo and leave before nightfall. You bid them all farewell and set about looking for a place to stay the night. The shadows start to lengthen as you walk through the narrow streets and alleyways. Suddenly, an old man in tattered clothes jumps out of a doorway and says, Looking for a bed, stranger? I know a good place that offers a room, soup and bread for only one gold piece. If you're interested, follow me. If you wish to pay and follow the old man, turn to 332. If you'd rather keep looking on your own, turn to 379. We are going to pay and follow the old man, turn to 332. Um, yeah, I've paid him as well, haven't I? Better take the uh, gold piece off. So that's 21. The old man hobbles ahead of you along the street. Um, and stops in front of a dilapidated house. He knocks loudly on the door three times with his stick. Suddenly, the door flies open and two rough-looking men run out brandishing cudgels. You hardly have time to draw your sword before being set upon by the robbers. Fight them one at a time. First robber, skill eight, stamina seven. Second robber, skill seven, stamina seven. If you win, turn to 89. Okay, let's do this. Uh, first robber. He was skill 8, stamina 7. And the other one was second robber. And that was skill 7, stamina 7. Let's do this. Right, we roll for him first. My skill is 11, obviously. Okay, rolling for him first, and we are off. 7 plus 8 is 15. I get 20, so 15 to 20, and we're fighting them one at a time, of course. Put some down to five, and again, uh, 18 to 20 again. Put some down to three. Uh, 19 to 16, yeah, 16, 19 to 16, so he wins. That puts me down to whatever it is, 22. Let's keep going. Uh, 15 to 21. Puts him down to one. Oh, I hate it when that happens. Um, 15 to 21 again. What are the odds? And now I'm not going to work them out because I can't be bothered. Okay, zero. That's the end of him. Right, second robber, seven and seven. 13 to 23. That um, twelve to uh, twenty 
22, I forgot to take the thing off, there we go, 12 to 22, so that's another one off. Uh, 13 to 17, Th yeah, 13 to 17, put some down to 1, nearly done. And then, uh, 14 to 16. And that is the end of him. That's, it. That's, in, uh, that's the end of the robbers, good. He lost uh, 2 points of stamina, that's not bad. And we're turning to 89. You look around, but the old man is nowhere to be seen. Rummaging quickly through the robber's pockets, you find a small brass telescope and three silver buttons. After packing away your finds, you set off again in search of a place to stay. It's under 379. Okay, so we've got uh, three silver buttons and a small brass... Um, small brass telescope. Okay. Three, or just put three, numerical three. Three silver buttons. Our next line. And small brass telescope. What's the difference between a monocular and a telescope? I think a telescope has to sort of expand or something. But I don't know. Anyway, um, turning to 379. Oh, that one's a bit sort of dodgy, isn't it? There it is. Seriously, that is, uh... Ah, the black, that's scary. Oh, they've done it again, they did that one twice. <laughs> Not surprised they, uh, scanned that one twice, blimey. Because that is, uh... Horrid, whatever it is. <laughs> anyway, 379, not to mention the scary blackness. Uh, looking up, you see a road sign indicating that you are in Clog Street. You walk down it all the way until it ends at a T-junction where it meets Harbour Street, which runs parallel to the shore. You look out to sea and watch the setting sun sink slowly... Blimey, that's a, a bit of alliteration, a a tongue twister. And watch the setting sun sink slowly beneath the horizon. Darkness envelops you and you wonder where to go next. At the end of the street to your left there are lights shining in windows and you can just hear the sound of singing and laughter. You decide to head towards the lights and soon find yourself outside the Black Lobster Tavern. You walk through the doorway into a smoke-filled room where seedy-looking characters sit at crowded tables laughing, joking and singing. You walk straight up to the barman and ask if he has a room for rent. Luckily there is one available. You pay him one gold piece. There we go. Puts us down to 20 gold. Uh, you pay him one gold piece for the room and ask if he knows of any ships which may be sailing south the next morning. I might do, he replies somewhat cagily, uh, but the information does not come free in Port Blacksand. Another gold piece and I'll introduce you to the ship's mate. Once again you reach into your pocket and pay the barman. <sighs> Blimey. Uh, he leads you over to one of the booths uh, or booths, whatever, along the far wall of the tavern, and point out and points out a man with a silk scarf tied over his bald head and an ugly scar running down from his left ear to the middle of his chin. Uh, Gargo is his name, says the barman. You sit down next to Gargo, introduce yourself, and ask if you can buy your passage south. Ten gold pieces, and you'll have to work for your food, comes the curt reply. Gargo does not look like a man with whom to bargain, so you agree to his price and pay. We set sail one hour after sunrise. The name of the ship is the Belladonna, and you'll find her at the end of the jetty leading down from the tavern. I'll see you in the morning. I'm going back to the ship now, says Gargo. You decide not to get involved with any of the tavern's characters, but to retire to your room. You stand up and and walk towards the stairs, but a large man carrying three flasks of ale bumps into you, spilling the drinks on the floor. If you wish to offer to buy him more ale, turn to 124. If you'd rather tell him not to be so clumsy, turn to 203. Okay, we're going to have to pay that 10 gold, aren't we? So that takes us down to 9 gold for the for the ship passage thing, and it's called the Belladonna. So, Belladonna it is. Uh, let me just write that down. 
information. Um, Belladonna. Belladonna ship. Okay, Belladonna is the substance taken from Deadly Nightshade. Um, very poisonous. I can't remember whether... I think it slows down one's heart and in small doses is actually used as a medicine. Because there's the one in Foxglove which speeds up your heart, or maybe it's the other way around, but Belladonna. It's weird because it's in the tomato family, in the well, same family as tomatoes, and yet tomatoes aren't poisonous, even though they are disgusting. Um, and yet Belladonna isn't. I do know potato berries are poisonous because they're in the Deadly Nightshade and tomato family as well. But uh, that's all I know, really. Anyway. Anyway, um. Yeah, so what we're going to do, we are going to, well, we'll find out what we're going to do in the next video. So I will write down what um, paragraph we're on, 379. So next paragraph is 379, just in case I don't remember. I usually do, and it usually opens the PDF up from where I stopped it, but um, just in case it doesn't. Anyway, so yeah, next video we will be deciding whether we're going to buy the man more ale or tell him not to be so clumsy and turn to uh yeah so turn to either 124 or 203 so thanks for watching i hope you can join me for more temple of terror and i will uh, see you next time goodbye